Welcome, everybody. Thank you for joining School Psych Podcast. We're really excited tonight um, to have Dr. Burns on again. And I want to, before we get rolling, um, interesting topic for sure and something that school psychologists need to be aware of. Um, I do want to direct people back to some previous podcasts that are also relevant too. So we've had Matt on now for, um, I think this is podcast number three, before he talked about one of his meta-analyses with cognitive evaluation and how that feeds into um, designing uh, interventions and whatnot, or really the fact that it, it doesn't assist with designing interventions. He's also come back on again to talk about um, curriculum-based assessment for instructional design, how to use CBA to um, figure out where you need to go with your students. And so that's really relevant. And then we've also had on um, within this topic of literacy and reading, um, Dr. Kilpatrick came on and we had Dr. Shanahan as well, as long as well as some guests talking about dyslexia. So if anybody's interested um, to look back at those episodes, I think that would be relevant. And now we're going to go a little bit more in depth, I think, tonight with some really interesting um, topics. I do want to say, too, that what kind of inspired this um, this podcast here is uh, at the time when we were talking about a guest, uh, Matt was on one of the Facebook groups that were mutually on and um, was posting some data and some research and the, the responses and it just kind of snowballed. And so I was really excited to um, watch what he had to say, uh, read what he had to say and see how people within kind of the science of reading community, um, their responses to that. So that kind of led us to where we are tonight. So, so thankful to have him here, but I'm going to pass it over to Rebecca. Um, if I didn't say so already, my name is Rachel and I'm in Maryland and um, Rebecca's going to tell us all how to participate tonight. Rebecca. Hi everybody. I'm Rebecca and I work in the state of Connecticut. We are hundred percent in person and we have two weeks to go. We finished our 13 week, 13th week of in-person schooling um, last week and we have two weeks to go till the holiday break. It's been quite intense but I'm happy to be here with you tonight. So if you are watching us live, I see you there, 21 of you. We love our, the live component of our podcast. Please feel free to find them to your YouTube account and chat let, right alongside the screen. We'll be looking up your comments and questions and we can even share them across the YouTube video so that um, at, that everybody can see the conversation that's happening there. If you'd like to send a more private message, feel free to inbox me at School Psych, your school psychologist, or the School Psych podcast page on Facebook. And on Twitter, you can inbox at podcast psyched um, or at Becca Kamis, and we'll be looking for the hashtag psyched podcast. We're looking forward to just having this conversation with all of you. And now I'm going to pass it off to Eric, who's going to introduce our fantastic guest. All right. Thank you, Rebecca. Hi, everybody. My name is Eric, and I am a school psychologist also in the state of Connecticut, and I'm excited to have Dr. Burns back with us. Um, just as a quick aside, um, a book that I've really been getting into recently, Evaluating Educational Interventions. Uh, this is the second edition. I have the first edition, and he and co-authors Chris Riley Tillman and Steve Kilgus um, have put together a great book. And if you are an educational interventionist, um, assessor, uh, teacher, special ed uh, support personnel, it's a really good book, school psychologist, uh, good book for looking at how to evaluate our interventions and using single study case designs to um, determine the effectiveness of our interventions. So um, as Rachel said, uh, Matt's been with us a number of times. We've had the pleasure of meeting him a number of times at NASP conventions and just really enjoying picking his brain and hearing about uh, all of the work and the research that he's been into. And as Rachel also said, his contributions on the Science of Reading page um, and some other uh, social media pages have really gained a lot of um, thoughtful discussion and and even a lot of questions and um, and some folks even concerned. So we thought it would be a great opportunity to have Matt come on and talk to us about the science of reading and um, reading interventions and what the research says. So welcome, Matt. Thanks for coming. We're happy to have you here. Thank you. Thanks so much for having me again. This is this is such a fantastic resource. I really appreciate you, this group taking this out and providing this for everyone. It's, it's a wonderful resource, thank you. So I, go ahead, Rachel. I was gonna say you have a PowerPoint, right? Yes. Do you wanna get into yes, that? Please. Okay, let's do it. Okay. Give me a second to catch up. All right. So today we're gonna to be talking about the science of reading and let me see if I can, if I click here, what happens? Nope, I have to go into it. So I can't see you and the PowerPoint at the same time. 
So uh, we're going to talk about reading. And I think this is so great that, that a school psych group is focusing on the science of reading. Because a vast majority of time, not that, over 50% of school psychologists' times in recent national surveys, Nick Benson in, in um, et al. did that recently, you know, we're still doing over half of our time spent in special ed evaluations. And by far the most common type of disability for which we test are learning disabilities, and 80% of learning disabilities are reading. I just finished a study, I tweeted it the other day, that yesterday I think it was, that we looked at uh, several reports from school psychs, and only, uh, this is from memory, so it might be quite, quite a little wrong, 48% included recommendations, and of those that did include recommendations, um, no, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, two-thirds of them included recommendations, but, but of those that did, uh, only half of them, 48%, were, were based on data. The rest were generic, you know, move the kid to the front of the room, still the most common recommendation. So I think school sites, we need to have a better understanding of reading, at least a strong understanding of reading to help support the kids with whom we work. And we know also, of course, this is, this is, this is not surprising data that 35% of fourth graders are proficient. So about a third of the kids, two thirds of the kids did not score in the proficient range, but they scored below basic half the time. Um, and if they happen to be an English language learner, two thirds of those kids are scoring below a basic level. And we also have 72% of teachers reported that the most common approach they use is balanced literacy. Pontisipinel, the most common one. Um, when taught, now one problem too is I didn't put this in here, a different study. Um, a vast majority, like it was 80%, again, that's from memory, that one was. Roughly 80% though of, of um, professors in colleges of education who do teacher training, when asked to define phonemic awareness, defined as sound symbol relationship. So we don't do a good job of really training teachers how to teach reading. And then Clark's really cool in-depth uh, study, it was, called, it was a mixed method, but an in-depth study with about 80 teachers found that their self-efficacy for teaching reading goes down after the first year. Most things in the world, you get more experience with it, you get more self-efficacy. But once you get out in the real world and you realize what you don't know, their self-efficacy actually decreased. Which brings us around to the science of reading. I like the International Literacies Association's definition as a corpus of objective in investigation and accumulation of reliable evidence about learning to read and how it should be taught. That means a lot more than just phonics. It seems to be the science of reading as being synonymous for use of decoding, teaching decoding, teaching phonics. And yes, of course, if you're not teaching decoding, not teaching phonics systematically, your instruction is not consistent with science of reading. That's true. But there's much more to it than just that. And one of the main findings by Connor, who's done quite a bit of work in this area, was that effective reading instruction is complex and individualized. And we still, believe it or not, we're still coming back to the National Reading Panel and their big five. You know, it was 20 years ago that we came out. And it's still shaping much of what we know about, um, about reading and how we teach it, how kids learn it. It's still being held up. It's still being used. By a lot of us, and I still think it's still it's it's seminal when we talk about science of reading. And I'll come back to that a few times. Okay, so science of reading, corpus of objective investigation and accumulation, objective experimental research. So objective investigation means experimental research, objective, not descriptions, not logical arguments, not blogs or books. And we're talking about um, objective. We mean something that can show cause and effect. So that's why we talk about experimentation, experimental designs, et cetera. I want to be able to show cause and effect. And the judgment of cause and effect is not subjective. Okay? It was shown this empirically or however, but we saw a clear line between cause and effect, okay? independent variable, dependent variable. And I got to tell you, so, so books, is, is a, books and blogs are issues with me. I was, I was one time doing a training in a school district on math, not reading. And I was talking about the importance of math, math fact fluency. And um, this person disagreed with me and said, well, what about this study? And he handed me this paper. Oh, well, let me see it. So I got it and started reading it. And it was a blog. And it was a blog that said, you know, you shouldn't teach kids how to, to memorize their math facts because doing so uh, increases anxiety. No study, no data, no, no. And that was seen to this teacher as evidence. And that's not evidence. If had they described a study, maybe somebody else's study, but had they described a study, that'd be different, but they didn't. 
So experimental research, not descriptive research, not logical arguments, not blogs or books, but experimental research. So what does that mean? Well, I'm not going to spend the next whatever, 45 minutes, half an hour talking to you about what experimental research is, because who wants to spend their Sunday night doing that, especially when the Kansas City Chiefs just kicked off. So there are lots of things that I would look at to be experimental research. And, and one thing in the science of reading, single case design, uh, you know, Eric mentioned in the book we have, single case design, and by the way, thanks for mentioning Eric, um, is a really great way to show experimentation. It doesn't show, it doesn't generalize very well. So you need, you know, 10, 20 studies of single case design to really feel confident in the results, but it's a wonderful way to show internal validity. I'm not going to get into that right now, but I'm going to focus on the, on the between group designs which is random assignment. Now, I'm going to talk about quasi-experimental in just a second. It has a purpose, but, it's, but random assignment is really what you need to see experimental designs. I also want to look at attrition and baseline equivalence. So if a bunch of kids drop out, that's a red flag. When you're reading an article, if the N was 60, by the end of the study was 40, that's a red flag. When you're reading an article, I want to see baseline equivalence. So before we did anything, the reading skills were the same. Articles need to say that. So if I'm reading an article, and they don't do randomization, and they don't have evidence to show the two groups were the same at baseline, or really, really close, then that's a real problem to interpret that. I'm gonna look, look at that uh, study questionably. Another big one for me is unit of analysis. They'll randomly assign by classroom and then analyze by kid. If you do it by classroom, you've got 20 classrooms. If you do it by kid, you've got 600 kids. But classroom was the unit of analysis. So the analysis should be classroom which reduces your power, which reduces all, and instead of having 300 and 300 per group, you've got 10, 10. And that's never going to show significance, never, but it's really hard to do. So watch out for those red flags when you're reading articles. You want to see randomization, watch to see if there's any attrition, you know, the number of kids just to stay roughly the same throughout, and do they have evidence to show the two groups were the same at baseline, and do they analyze by the unit? If they're randomly assigned by teacher, the analysis should be by teacher. If they're randomly assigned by dyad, the analysis should be by dyad or classroom, or whatever they use. And I don't care about alpha. Oh my gosh, think back to your intro to stats class and the null hypothesis. I have not done, I have published, I don't know, 200 articles and I bet not a single one of them have, has tested the null hypothesis. Um, alpha is simply designed to show you the results are not due to sort of sampling error. I don't care about alpha because if I have, you know, the, there's a great, I should have put this in the presentation, a great meme of a pumpkin, a jack-o'-lantern, and what's carved out in it is not a scary face, but it's carved out alpha equals 0 0.06. Like, that's so horrifying, right? Well, if that happens, you get alpha equals 0 0.06, what do you do? You have 100 kids, alpha equals 0 0.06, what do you do? You collect more data. Alpha is the relationship between N and size of the effect. So if you don't change the size of the effect, but you increase the N, your alpha goes down. So if you have an N of 300 kids, you're going to get significance if for this effect size of like 0 0.08. So instead, I want to look at D. Now D, if you can see my cursor here, can you guys see my cursor when I move it? Can you nod yes? Yeah, yeah you can. Uh, no, oh, I don't okay. see it. Do you guys see it? How about now? Oh, here okay. it is, yeah. So what I tell people, practitioners and my students to do, this is not the formula for Cohen's D. Cohen's G, I mean, I mean uh, Hedges G is even better. But if you're reading research, you just want a quick interpretation of the results. Here's an easy way to do it. Take the treatment and control groups, just, oops, just divide the means, and then divide by the average standard deviations. Okay, so the standard deviation of the experimental, standard deviation of control, add those two, divide by two, and then subtract the mean difference by that. That is not D. D is, is the variance. It's not standard deviation. G takes into account N. It, this is not the correct formula for D. All I'm saying is when you're reading an article, you don't need the if you do what I just showed you, this, this simple quick thing, it's really close to, to the, the, the correct D, unless your unless you're two groups, the variances are really off, and they usually aren't, it's really close. So it might be a 0 0.6, and the true Cohen's D might be you know, 0.61. It's really close. So just to get a sense when you're reading it, they don't report effect size, which they should. Just take a look at this real quickly. The means of the two groups divide up the mean difference of the two groups divided by the average standard de deviations of the groups. And that can give you a good sense of the type of effect. How large do you need to see? Well, Cohen's famous D or G, a 0 0.80 is large, 0 0.50 is medium. Well, Tennessee R squared and eta squared, if you don't know what that is, that's in essence 
percent variance accounted for by the independent variable. That's an oversimplification. But again, for consumption, that's totally fine. Remember, Tim Keith has a wonderful uh, chapter in Best Practices. It wasn't in the most recent one, but the other iterations before. And he said, school psychologists need to be the researchers in the schools. They should be the ones who, of course, can conduct research, but they also should be the ones who can consume and synthesize research. So if a principal says, I'm thinking about starting a responsibility thinking room, what's the research say? The school site should be the one that can consume it and talk to the principal about what the research says. So if they report an R squared or an eta squared, you want to see 0 0.25, 0 0.26, that's a large effect. 0.13 is medium, less than that, you know, is, is roughly small. Again, don't get too hung up on these exact criteria. Like sometimes a 0.7 is really quite good. Uh, so a, a, a D of 0.7 is quite good. Uh, sometimes an R squared of 0.16 you know, is really quite good. But, but generally speaking, these are the accepted uh, ranges. If you're just interpreting the articles, this, these are good criteria to use. But this, I've seen this happen a lot. They'll do a pretest and post test and report a D. Okay, or G, but usually it's D. And they say the D was 0 0.8. That's a large effect. No, 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 no. Cohen's criteria of 0 0.8 is based on between group designs. Within group design data are what we call auto correlated. So point A and point B are correlated. How well the kid does on point B will, will be related to how well they did on point A. And when that happens, effects inflate dramatically. So we did a meta-analysis, uh, uh, Dana Wagner and I in 2008, we published it in School Psych Review. We found an average D of within group designs for large effects. In other words, the researcher identified this as a large effect through objective measures. The average effect size was 2.80. So it's a pre and post test and they report a D of like 1.8 and they say, isn't this huge? No, it's not. It's actually moderate, probably 1.8. Uh, but within group to be a large effect, you probably need to see more almost close to three standard deviation units. 2.8 was what we found to be large. And then overlapping metrics for single case design. Uh, if you don't know what that is, that's okay. But when they report single case design, they might report what's called a NAP or a PAND or, a, um, uh, or one of many others. But they're all overlap metrics. And a couple of studies, uh, one um, being a meta-analysis and one, well, both being meta-analyses, found around 95% to be a strong effect. So with single case design, they report some sort of overlap metric, and they'll call it that. They'll call it non-overlapping data of some sort. You guys see, see about a 0.95 to be a large effect. Okay, so when you're reading articles, is it a good effect? I don't know. Well, here's some good criteria that you can use. They're not perfect. Don't get too hung up on them, but they're a good place to start. Now, I would love to know. I wish this was interactive, because I'd love to ask how many of you know who Richard Feynman is. He's one of my heroes. I'm about to talk to you about the dangers of hero worship within research and cite a hero to do so, which I understand the hypocrisy. But Richard Feynman was a very interesting guy. He wrote the, on the pleasure of finding things out. He wrote, surely you're uh, Mr. Feynman, surely you're joking. Honestly, seriously, get these books and, and read them for, for leisure. They're, they're really enjoyable. He was an interesting person. But he, was, he won the 1965 Nobel Prize for Physics. And he um, was a doc student on the Manhattan Project. Uh, his advisor was the, was the chair, I guess I'll call it, the leader of the Manhattan Project, and he appointed him as a doc student. Now, he defended before it actually began. But, so he was the, you know, this young guy right out of grad school on the Manhattan Project, and he very interesting person. Now, he became famous in the 60s for these in, in 70s, for introductory lectures to physics. He made physics simple for people. And he has such great quotes, and this one's one of my all-time favorites. If it disagrees with the experiment, he's a physicist, he talks experiment. I might say, um, you know, study. He also talks about guesses. He said, the first thing, the first step in the scientific method is take a guess. I might call that a hypothesis, but same, same thing. He says, if it disagrees with the experiment, it's wrong. It's that simple. It's that simple to science. If it doesn't make any, it doesn't make any difference how beautiful your guess is. It doesn't matter how smart you are, who made the guess, or what your name is. If it disagrees with the experiment, it's wrong. That's all there is to it. I love that thinking. That's kind of so, so it, you know, there are, there are things that haven't been studied yet, but there are lots of things that have been studied for which we have a conclusion. And oftentimes in practice, we do something different. So I have to talk about this real briefly before I move, come back to that point. Feynman also talked about cargo cult science, which is a wonderful um, discussion. One person out of 40 said they knew Feynman was. Oh, good. I wish I knew that person was. I'm so excited that one of you knew. 
honestly, uh, uh, The Pleasure of Finding Things Out is one of my favorite books ever. So uh, he wrote in, in, the, in that book about cargo cult science. Now he, called, he said that in, the, in World War II, there was these remote islands that in the Pacific that we used as Air Force bases. So we came in and built these landing strips, et cetera, and we landed and all of a sudden found out there were inhabitants on these islands. We didn't know that. We'd be in the United States military. And so, of course, we, they go there and, and they, they, they actually were quite good to the inhabitants. They, they gave them food and water and built things for them. And then the war ended and they left. Well, when they left, the natives, um, that's probably not the right word to use, um, inhabitants. The inhabitants, if that's the right word, if not, I'll apologize. But the inhabitants didn't speak English, didn't know, didn't know why they were there to begin with, didn't know why they left. And so they built these structures to look like the structures that they built and then tore down and took with them to try and entice them to come back. And Feynman talks about cargo cult science. He says we're doing the same thing. It looks like an experiment, but it really isn't. And it's not true experiment if it's a quasi-experimental or action research. Now, having said that, I love quasi-experimental research and action research. I don't, don't hear me that say that that's bad. It has a place. I'll talk about that in a second. But if, if it's not random, so quasi-experimental or action research, then baseline equivalence is extremely important. you got to show these groups are the same at baseline. If you see quasi-experimental research and it doesn't show, show baseline equivalence, I, I must stop reading. The other thing that quasi-experimental research doesn't do a good job of often is they don't measure implementation integrity. Did you do the intervention as you said you would? If you don't measure that, you don't know causal. I really struggle to say causal effect because you don't know if they actually did the independent variable. So if I'm reading a quasi-experimental study, there's no randomization. I want to see baseline equivalence, implementation integrity. If that's the case, then there, there's a place for that, right? It can show it works in, in, in um, natural settings. It can also be the first study. You know, we may want to do that first to see is it worth doing something more controlled, more tightly controlled. A lot of brain research is what I would call quasi-experimental. When you take two groups of kids and have them engage in reading, for example, and they measure their brains, and one's LD and one isn't, for example. One has a learning disability, one group doesn't. That's not random assignment. That's a quasi-experimental design. And we never call it that. And we don't do a good job of showing baseline equivalency. We don't do I mean, all that stuff. So I'm always a little cringy about some of the brain research that, that is out there. All right. So again, coming back to this definition of, of um, science of reading. So far, we've talked about objective experimental research. Let's talk about accumulation. I love meta-analyses and websites. Now, if they're the right ones, now, right websites. So in terms of meta-analyses, I think a meta-analysis is a really great way to read the whole uh, research literature. And there's a couple of really great sources out there. Many of you are probably familiar with Hattie's book, Visible Learning. I think it's great. If I, in fact, if I were a czar of education for a day, Two things I would do right away. Number one is I would ban the font of Spinel. Talk about that in a second. And number two, I would give a copy of Hattie's book to every single practitioner. It takes everything you can think of around just education and, and makes it very simple to understand. For example, whole language. Oh, you can't see my cursor. I'll switch it back. Whole language. There's been um, 64 studies, 197 effects, 630 people. And they found the average effect size was 0 0.06, darn near zero. Now he calls reverse effects or negative effect, things like grade retention. He talks about developmental effects, which means it doesn't change anything. They just grew as they would grow. Then teacher effects and desired effects. His desired effects a little low for me. I'd rather be at more like 0 0.6, but that's okay. But whole language 0 0.06 doesn't work. We know that. Phonics instruction, um, 425 studies, almost 6,000 effects, 12,000 kids. And the average effect size is 0 0.60. We know that. Repeated reading. Um, only two meta analyses, only 54 studies, 156 effects, and one of them must not have reported the number of people. That's a bummer. But we still see an average effect size of 0 0.67 across 54 studies. That's a pretty reliable effect. We see, um, that good. We see comprehension programs. Uh, we see uh, nine meta-analyses, 415 studies, almost you know, 2,600 kids and 11,000 uh, 11, kids. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, 2,600 effects, 11,000 kids. And an average effect size of 0.58, large effect, 
So we know those things. So he also does a wonderful thing, looks at, looks at teacher roles and says there's really two roles. I'll put them both up and talk. Now let's do it one at a time. So activator. So activator is all the studies we can do that, that the teacher, in which the teacher is um, you know, actively engaged in teaching, I think is how they would describe it. And what we see there is, you know, drill and practice. Folks, drill and practice is a large effect. It, it, practicing works. Practicing helps kids remember things better and generalize it better. Large effect. Feedback, one of the most powerful things we can do is provide good instructional feedback. Teaching metacognition, direct instruction, mastery learning, formative assessment, all strong effects, according to Hattie. And the total for the teacher as activator was 0.6, which he argued is a strong effect. Now, when you look at the other role, which he called facilitator, facilitator, and those are things like simulation games, um, inquiry-based instruction, class size, getting a smaller class size, problem-based learning and inductive teaching. The effect size there is quite small, 0 0.07. So his point is teachers as activators is a much more effective approach. Thank you, I mentioned Hattie. There's also, I'm gonna show you uh, some resources from intervention, uh, I'm sorry, intensiveintervention.org, wonderful website. I wish people would use that more frequently. And the other, IES has some wonderful practice guides. IES is the Institute for Education Science, the branch of the U.S. government that deals with uh, research. The branch of the Department of Ed deals with research. And the What Works Clearinghouse is part of the, of the IES. And of course, we know the What Works Clearinghouse was basically the what, what Doesn't Work Clearinghouse. And it has been disappointing. But one thing that I think they've done that's been fabulous are these practice guys. They get together researchers. They look at all the research. And that's let's do a meta-analysis and tell you these are what the research says works. And here's how to implement them. It's written for practitioners, really well done, a bunch of free PDFs. There's one on teaching comprehension to young kids. There's one on you know, teaching math to girls. There's one on turning around low-performing schools. I mean, there's like 15 or 16 of them that are really quite good. I've already talked about Hattie a little bit. But also, this intensiveintervention.org is a wonderful website by the National Center of Intensive Intervention. And if you go there and you, you go to uh, tool chart, and you can see academic interventions, and behavior interventions, academic screeners, academic practice monitoring tools. Just look at the intervention one for a second. I just grabbed a page here. Uh, I, I, I filtered it by reading. And I think I did elementary school too, just to make it easier. And this shit tells you, obviously a full dot is a good rating. An empty dot is a, is a weak rating. And these are the effect sizes. So burst reading, not very good study designs. I've never heard of burst reading. I don't know what that is. And the effects are pretty small. This early vocabulary connections, good, good, good study, and you know, moderate effects. It's pretty good. So you go down and look at a few things to point out, you know, a couple of good ones here. Um, let me, let me, I highlighted a few on purpose. So I read um, poor design and the effects were not, um, were not uh, reported. So they're, they're I, I shouldn't say not reported. They're not reported here on this page. Uh, Lexia, which is commonly used, you know, a, Moderate to weak design, and the effects tend to be pretty small, with one minor exception in the, you know, one something about a good design. Read 180, however, good design, but only a small effect. Read and recovery, questionable design. I they mean, say a large effect, but questionable design. Sound partners, I, I, I know science of reading pages. I talk about sound partners all the time. It's super cheap. It's just a book. It's like 20 bucks or something, 25 bucks. Good design, large effects, moderate to large effects. It's a great tool. Stepping so to literacy, another one. Good design, strong effect. So that's something you can get. And if you click on any of these, it, uh, in the um, study where it's blue right there, this is a screenshot, so I can't click on it. But you click on it, and it takes you to a page that describes the intervention, how to get it, how much it costs, and here's all the research behind it. So it's a great website. I think it's uh, really helpful to practitioners. All right, so we've talked about how to evaluate experimental design, how to collect this accumulation of studies. Now let's apply these to common practices without research. Here are a couple things that are commonly done, but maybe not a good research base. I just found this meta-analysis. Um, I see a question there about recommendations encouraging districts to move away from f and I'll talk about that in just a minute, actually. Um, this is a meta-analysis by Puzio. I'm not sure if I'm saying that right. It just came out 2020, and they looked at differentiated instruction. And you can see they found the letter hedges G, 
So interpret roughly the same way as Cohen's D. 0.8 is a large effect. So with the exception of one, there are pretty small effects. Now, they would say that because the effect size doesn't include zero for comprehension, doesn't include zero for, I'm sorry, the limit, the range, the lower limit is above zero. They say that's a meaningful effect. I'm not so sure I buy that, but still, obviously these, these data to me suggest there's an effect, it's just not very small. There's a reliable effect, I mean, it's just not very big. There's a reliable effect, it's just not very big. And if you differentiate based on MAP data, which the publishers of MAP, Measures of Academic Progress, NWA, the MAP, the MAP tests, if you differentiate based on their strand scores, the effect size for it was literally zero. I've, I don't think I've ever seen an effect size of just zero. So that was, that was discouraging. Clear and integrated curriculum mo clear model and integrated curriculum model, two separate models, both have large effects, but they were for gifted kids. And I don't want to generalize that to regular kids. The, the, I shouldn't say regular. <laughs> The, to non-gifted kids. The rest was 0.14 to 0.20. And their critic Puzio pointed out that very few of the studies describe how to differentiate instruction. They then concluded there were no studies about guided reading. So it's a long way to say the research around differentiation is up in the air still, but we don't really know how to, they don't really study how to do it. And the, uh, the, the sort of commonly used model that claims to do it is guided reading, and there were no studies that Puzio found that looked at guided reading in this 2020 meta-analysis. So I went and just searched guided reading studies. I found none. I found one study that, not study, one review of research. Okay, let's look at that. It wasn't a meta-analysis, a, re a review of research. It was by La Quinta. I hope, I hope I'm saying that right. Oh, you know what? That's an I. I, La Quinta. I hope I'm saying that right. And it's 14 years old. 22 references in that article. 18 were books or position statements. One was a qualitative dissertation. And then Jewel 98, a longitudinal study showing early interventions effective, the National Reading Panel, and then Torgerson 1998, also showing the importance of early intervention. Not a single study in this review of, of uh, guided reading actually studied guided reading. So I'm going to stand by that. I think guided reading is a practice without a research base. This is one of my favorites, multiple intelligences. Uh, good old, good old uh, Howard Gardner. Uh, uh, Meta analysis 1975 found an average effect size of 1.08. Okay, good. Well, that's done. 75 studies were cried out loud. All those studies were conducted in Turkey. Why? I don't know. 64 were master's theses and 11 were dissertations. Not a single published study in this meta analysis. And none of them, they all dealt with science, social studies, et cetera. None looked at reading. So I would argue, I kind of argue multiple intelligences is not research-based anyway, but it certainly lacks research base for reading. If someone knows of a study that's published in experimental, please let me know. I'd love to read it. I really would. I mean that. Another one, this is the one I'll second back to the FMP, the level literacy intervention, LLI. The most common reading program in America today, according to Ed Week Research Center, their survey of teachers. 43% explicitly mentioned LLI. Um, a study, I, there's no meta-analyses. I, I have searched a lot to try and find studies, because I've done three dealing with it, trying to find research on Fontes Spinel LLI. And there's one. It's published. It's not published. It's on a website by the University of Memphis, Ransford, called it and all. It's a fine study. Um, but the, the effect sizes are small. It's K through second grade. I forget the number of students. I think it's a good sample. I forget the number off the top of my head. Kindergarten, the average effect size, 0 0.09. First grade, 0.32. Second grade, 0.16. So really small effects. It's negligible for kindergarten and small for second grade. You know, small, a little, little better for first, but not small effect. So I would argue LLI, Fontes Pinnell is also an approach. Fontes Pinnell, when you do research, when you look at guided reading, Fontes Pinnell comes up as a guided reading approach. So I would argue there's no research. I shouldn't say no. There are no published studies on LLI, there's no published studies on FMP, there's no published studies on the, on the framework on which FMP was written. It's, it's, it's a questionable practice. Now, will that convince your district to change? I doubt it. Uh, John Hospital, my, a good friend of mine, University of Massachusetts, uh, Amherst, uh, said, you can't bring data to a dogma fight. And for some reason, that's, that's exactly what this is. This is a, 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 a school of thought, this is a philosophy, and I'm, I'm struggling to get schools to actually pay attention to the data. And the thing that troubles me the most, I did a study a few years ago, published in the Journal of School Psych, we looked at the kids 
actually reading the book that the FMP said they should read. Like it's, it's an L, they, they, were, they read an L. And among the struggling with good readers, they tend to underestimate their reading a little bit, we think. But struggling readers, two-thirds of them couldn't read the book. Two-thirds of the struggling readers couldn't read the book that was at their level. So for the kids that needed it the most, it not only did not help them, I would argue it probably hurt them. So will that convince your school? I don't know. I sort of doubt it. But if a lack of research and research suggests this hurts, I come back to Feynman's quote, which is, if it disagrees with the study, it's wrong. Oh, I love this one. Oh, there's my, any dys dyslexia, uh, decoding dyslexia uh, fans out there and, and members have just stopped listening, and I'm sorry. But I, I, am, um, I am a friend to that movement. I, I think the work that they're doing is fabulous. But the research on Orton Gillingham is not convincing. 2006, a study, uh, not study, or, uh, a review, a meta-analysis, Richie and Goki, Gok, probably 12 studies. Five of them found an effect that Orton Gillingham was stronger than the control group. The rest either was inconsistent or the control group had the better effect. 11 rows were quasi-experimental, only one experimental design. And that one was with college students and they used spelling, I'm sorry, they used the Wilson program to look at spelling. So literally there are no studies. I, so I, I, I've spent the last couple of days, now I'll, I'll admit it's only been the last couple of days, searching the internet to find other published studies on Orton Gillingham and I have found zero since 2006. There might be dissertations, et cetera, but no published studies. So I would question the research base around Orton Gillingham. Doesn't mean it's a bad program, just means the research base is not there yet. All right, so that's areas which there's questionable. Let's talk about some points of agreement. And we'll just do this quickly here. Uh, we know that systematic phonics instruction is critical to learning how to read. Like that's it, there's consensus on that. I'm not even gonna give you citations for these because there's like 20 of them for all of these, if not more. Cooperative learning. Boy, cooperative learning. Uh, oh, someone just put, it's always in the private evaluation and recommendations. Yeah, that's, I think there are better things you can do. First of all, Orton Gillingham's expensive. It's good. I'm not, I'm not telling you it's bad, although I'd say there's no research to support it. But um, there are things that, I think the, the mechanism in Orton Gillingham, this is just me talking, I've never studied it, is that there's strong a decoding emphasis to it. It's not the multi. It's not the um, uh, the uh, multi-sensory approach, and there are lots of really intensive, good decoding interventions that would probably work just as well. So, if someone recommends Orton Gillingham, there are things you can do that are aligned with Orton Gillingham that that cost less, and there's a stronger research base. Again, I refer you to this National Center for Intensive Intervention, intensiveintervention.org, to look for some resources around that. And Matt, if I can jump in, this kind of makes me think about, um, I think about all the money that's involved in these curriculums. And I think about even uh, to make kind of a comparison to Sykes and our test kits. I mean, yep. like a new version of the WISC or one of these big tests comes out, people just buy it. Like they don't need to do research on it because they kind of already know that it's going to sell and that's what they care about. And so nobody bothers to study it, at least on the on the side mm -hmm. of the people creating the program because they're going to make money. So why, mm -hmm. why do they need to worry about it? You know, why do they need to, you know, so it's, it's a mess. <laughs> That's right. So that it, at least in the test, like the, like a new risk comes out, you know, that it's normed on thousands of kids. You know, they're going to look, look at the reliability. You know, they're going to value, value the validity. There's no, you, no one does that as a public, no one first writes the curriculum, studies it for five years and then publishes it. Like, that doesn't happen. Right, so it's 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 a different ball of wax completely. Uh, yeah, I agree that um, Teachers College just finally came out and said that you got you got to have decoding, and for and for Lucy Calkins herself to say that was was a pretty dramatic shift. Well, so cooperative learning, dozens of dozens dozens of studies on that it's shown to be effective. Writing and reading integrated, a wonderful special issue in Reading Research Quarterly. Um, recently just came out, and um, Steve Graham is an author on this article about how science of reading really cannot be separated from science of writing. Lots of studies show the importance of those two things. Spelling matters. Spelling is a good indicator of decoding. Lots of studies have shown that. If a kid can't spell, there's a good chance they can't decode, especially if they're a struggling reader. We'll see a lot of false positives. We'll see a lot of kids who still struggle with spelling, but they decode fine. But among struggling readers, if they struggle to spell, they probably struggle with decoding. And the mechanics of writing matter, uh, Virginia Berninger and others have shown that a number of times. Headmanship, spelling, letter formation, all that kind of stuff 
influences writing. So uh, you're about, are you saying curriculums that use OG approach have not been researched? Uh, um, yes, I'm saying that, that no, no, I'm not saying that. I'm saying I looked at Orton Gillingham specifically. Uh, I did not look at Wilson's or Barton. The only study that had an experimental approach, approach used Wilson's. And it was with older kids, uh, with, uh, college kids, and only looked at spelling. All right, so those are some areas. Some, a couple, I, I'm, I'm cherry picking a few things to highlight here, obviously. One of which is something that's a big issue for, for me, and I do research around it, so I'm going to talk about that. My analysis we did in 2018, looking at targeting reading interventions. We targeted the phonemic awareness, phonics, fluency, vocabulary, comprehension based on the student deficit. Found 27 studies among elementary school kids, the average effect size 0 0.54, 27 studies. All of them had a control group. 15 met what works clearinghouse standards, seven uh, met with reservations. And among those that met the standards, so the good studies, rigorous designs, 0.59. So among the best studies, we saw a, you know, a moderate effect, 0.59. But when you targeted it, and 13 studies did that, the effect size was 0.65. If it was comprehensive, LLI, um, read 180, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, the average effect size was 0.36. So not quite half, but, but quite a bit smaller. So it was more effective to target the intervention. Reliably, we've seen that through experimental studies. Fluency matters. Reading fluency is closely related to comprehension. We know that. I, I mentioned the repeated reading uh, meta-analysis earlier. One of the on Science of Reading uh, website, somebody mentioned how re re repeated reading had fallen out of favor. I, I don't know why they said that. Repeated reading, maybe it has in practice, but the research around it has been ongoing with recent meta-analysis uh, just a, a year or two ago, finding large effects again. So we still see effect sizes of that 0 0.6, 0 0.7 uh, range quite a bit. And of my recent meta-analysis looking at non-repetitive approaches, things like um, partner reading, reading widely, we call it. So you know, ind independent reading, reading a bunch of different books, reading books at your level. Eight studies for that, and the average effect size is 0.18. So repeated reading was better than, than non-repetitive approaches. And Hasbro and Tindall, they've done this study a number of times. I, I, I love that contribution they made. With, you know, if you're not using AmesWeb, you're not using Dibbles, you, but you're using a fluency probe, you're getting, getting reading A to Z, or you're getting readworks.org. If, you if you're not familiar with readworks.org, highly recommend it. It's all free. Um, yeah, that's the one right there. Um, Andrew, thank you. Lee Woon, uh, 2017. Um, yes, there's not much evidence to transfer of unpracticed passages. The evidence for transfer is, is the effect size for transfer is, is smaller. Yes, but still, still, uh, uh, you know, small to moderate. Um, I was going to say. Oh, yeah. So, Hasbro and Tyndall, um, if you're not using one of those main things, but you're using readworks.org, which, which is a free resource, it's a, thousands of passages you can sort by by uh, type, by grade, by lexile, by whatever. And if you're using something like that, you want to do fluency assessments, they've published some, some national norms based on several different uh, sources of data. Um, when you mentioned how you know repeated reading may be falling out of mm -hmm. favor, um, that reminded me of when we did have Dr. Mm -hmm. Hillpatrick on, and I think that and, uh, Eric and Rebecca jump in and correct me if I'm wrong. He went into a little bit about how um, or, you know orthographic mapping and the process of you know a child isn't going to get better and more automatized with their fluency until they're engaged in the orthographic mapping process. Mm -hmm. And so he kind of said that the interventions need to focus on the phonemic awareness or assumedly the font if that's where the deficit is, yeah. instead of the fluency. So oh, I'm wondering if So again, I, the meta-analysis I mentioned earlier, and several studies I've done, that's if the kid needs phonemic awareness, repeated reading is, is it's, well, it's not going to help. Uh, if the kid needs decoding, repeated reading is probably not going to help. If the kid can read fluently, but they don't understand what they read, repeated reading is not going to help. We have to target the intervention to the kid's uh -huh. needs. So if the kid needs phonemic, I, I work backwards, so I find the most fundamental skill. So if the kid needs phonemic awareness, that's what they get. If the kid needs decoding, that's but their phonemic awareness is fine, they get decoding. If the kid needs um, uh, fluency, but their decoding and phonemic awareness are, are fine, they get they get fluency, et cetera. So yes, you have to it has to fluency. There is no such thing as a universal intervention. You've got to target the student's deficit and address the intervention to match that. So the website, I think that's the most recent one that Hasbro and Tyndall published on the norms for oral reading fluency. Now, just a few minutes left, let's talk about a few questions that still remain that need to be researched. 
I love this. So uh, Chris Levin's turned me on to this as well. Um, Katz does a really interesting research and in thinking around, uh, can we actually teach reading comprehension? Is that really what we teach? Or is it just we teach all the component parts and comprehension happens? Is comprehension a byproduct of good reading? And Cromley and Acevedo did one of my favorite studies in 2007, where they wanted to see what leads to comprehension. They looked at five things. And the number one, number two, and they were tied and way ahead of everybody else was background knowledge and vocabulary. Those are by far the two most important things. And they, they you know, were tied and way ahead, of, way ahead of the rest. Number three in that list was correct differences about reading. Number four was re word reading skill. And number five was strategy use. Now, let me infer a little here. I'll make a jump um, that, that if a kid's struggling with comprehension, we might do a strategy. Well, chances are, according to this study, I would argue, I'm, I'm stretching the data a little bit here, I admit that, um, you're better off to teach, teach, teach kids how to read the words. And I would argue that most of the time, kids who struggle with comprehension are actually struggling with fluency. I've done two studies, uh, one published in, in uh, psychology in the schools, I think the other one was assessment for effective intervention, where we found that unless a kid can read ele elementary school, unless a kid can read about 60 words per minute, comprehension does not occur. So most of the time we see a comprehension deficit, it's really a fluency problem. So based on that, you know, the best thing we can do to help most kids who struggle with comprehension is background knowledge and vocabulary. Sure, teaching inferencing, sure. Yes, we should teach strategy. Yes, we should work on word reading skills. Yes, we should teach inferencing. But if I want my kid who's struggling with comprehension to do better, background knowledge and vocabulary is oftentimes the way to go. Content areas, oh my gosh, science, content areas like science, social studies, we should that should be flooded with science of reading. Um, when I uh, when I do interventions at the secondary level, middle school, high school, a vast majority of the time, uh, that's probably that's probably strong. But but close to half the time, if not more than half, those interventions occur in a content area course, social studies or 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 um, or, or uh, science. A couple areas packed promoting acceleration of comprehension and content through text. I, I cited Swanson oh, typo there one parenthesis sorry. Found an average effect size of 0.59 for social studies, and we see small effects on reading comprehension. So that's a bit disappointing, but it's really a, a, a intervention to help kids understand social studies content better using, I would argue, science of reading, you know, approaches consistent with that. And um, we see effects on their ability to understand comprehension, uh, social studies with a, also an effect on comprehension. We just landed a, a nice grant to study that, to replicate that study. So we'll know more about that soon. And by the way, uh, getting back to Rachel's point, one of the questions we're looking at this time is, are there kids for whom this intervention is more effective? So if the kids have poor decoding skills, this intervention probably won't help. I, I'm hypothesizing, or it's fine, let's see, I'm guessing. But if the intervention, um, if the kids do have good decoding fluency skills, this is probably the better intervention. And then um, project-based learning, Nell Duke. Uh, this article is still in press, I think. It's a wonderful study. I mean, you, it's so tight. Uh, I, I just recently read it and really impressed with the, with the methodology. It's all there. I, I'd like to see more description of fidelity of implementation, um, but still in that, it was really well done. And I think it was reading for an authentic purpose. Uh, I, I say I think because I think that's oversimplifying. So I think um, that um, it's, it's more than just having kids read for authentic purpose. But I want to come back to that because remember I said earlier, science of reading is a lot more than just decoding. This is one that a lot of people who uh, uh, who advocate for science of reading cringe when they hear things like authentic purpose. Yet there's several studies on it. And this is a beautiful randomized design with a large N. It, they randomly assigned by uh, teacher. They analyzed by teacher. I mean, it was really well done. And they found an average effect size of 0.48. Not average. They found an effect size of 0.48 for social studies and effect size of 0.18 for informational reading. So we saw an effect on content area, but another small effect on informational reading. And then I have to talk about this because this was the controversy in which I was involved in the role of phonemic awareness for older kids. I would argue that's still a question in need of discussion and research. research. Um, I said that, um, I've said many times, you kid gets the intervention they need. If they struggle with phonemic awareness, that's what they should get. My contention has always been that most of the kids beyond second or third grade, their core deficit's not going to be phonemic awareness. The National Reading Panel, these are some quotes I pulled from there from the meta-analysis. They found the effect of phonemic, training, train, phonemic awareness training was the largest for preschool. Kindergarten was significantly larger than first through, and second through sixth grades. I wish they had broken it down second, third, fourth, fifth, instead of lumping it together. 
Because I'm willing to bet that we'd see second grade still okay, but then third, fourth, and fifth grade, sixth grade is you see the low effects. But they didn't look at it that way. They had kindergarten, first grade, second through sixth. They said these findings indicate that younger students gain the most phonemic awareness, and younger means kindergarten, first grade, preschool. The transfer of PA to spelling was greater among kindergartners than second graders, and there was no transfer, that's my emphasis, to spelling, zero, uh, among second through sixth graders. The effect size was zero. So then I got interested in this one. That analysis, the phonemic awareness one, really helped reading people a lot, I would argue. It was, it, they, that National Reading Panel report on phonemic awareness really brought phonemic awareness into the reading conversation. And, uh, but when I was doing interventions, intervention research, I kept seeing inconsistent results. So I reanalyzed the data, published this in psychology in the schools. And we looked at the effect of, effect of phonemic awareness interventions on three different types of interventions, uh, outcomes, I'm sorry. Pseudo words, nonsense words, word lists, words in isolation, and actual context, connect and text reading. 24 studies look at pseudo words, average effect size 0.84. 48 studies looked at words in isolation, average effect size 0.92, but actual connected text reading was a much smaller effect. So that got me thinking more about, about um, this uh, idea of uh, interventions for free awareness on reading. And they, again, the, they didn't look at it by grade level, uh, other than just second through sixth. So dig a little more deeply. I've cited this before on, that, on the website, on the Facebook page, Shafolius, McDowell et al., uh, Perilla. You know, they say that most kids develop phonemic awareness by second grade. Paul Atkinson, 2020, just came out or is in press, launched a study with 91 kids and they had three points in time. The kids were right about four years old, three, three years, 11 months. Um, oh, I've seen people have posted. Uh, I, I'm going back. I'm not seeing the, the page where you post your comments. So I'm sorry. I'm, I'm not ignoring you. I just didn't know there was anything right now. Um, 311 was the first time point, three years, 11 months was the average. And then again, with, when they were five years, six months old, six years, six months old, all non-readers, all struggling readers. And at time one and two, phonemic awareness predicted word reading, but by time three, it only predicted accuracy, didn't predict alphabetic decoding, lexical, orthographic aspects of reading. And I just, I mentioned to um, the group beforehand that I just finished, I was doing a, I'm doing a study based on, I'm um, looking at the accuracy of the Shaywitz dyslexia scale as a screener, and I'll do a spoiler alert right now. It's terrible. Uh, if you're interested, email me. I'll, I'll talk to you more about that. But, but that study's not under review yet. It's, well, it's, it's not published. It's under review. So I reanalyzed the data based on this conversation. I looked at only struggling readers. So 93 kids, just struggling readers, according to STAR data, STAR Early Literacy and STAR uh, Reading. The struggling readers, this is their average CTOP phonemic awareness composite score. Kindergarten, first, second, third grade. Now remember, this is a age, an age-based standard score. So a score of you know three, I'm making that number up, in kindergarten is something very different than a score of three in third grade. So this is just the this is the age-based standard score. So among the kindergartners, yeah, they were all below you know, the 15th percentile. The first graders, not all, but the mean ones. The first graders, the average score was slightly below 25th percentile, but by second and third grade, the average score is above, above a standard score of 95. So getting close to the 50th percentile as the average score, that was a, a large effect, a significant large effect. And if you look at the relationship between them, so here we have correlations, and then the number of kids who identified as low in phonemic awareness, again, struggling readers uh, by grade. Kindergarten, relationship between the CTOP composite, I'm sorry, yeah, CTOP phonemic awareness and the Dibble composite score, and I standardized all the scores and everything. Um, 0.35. Significant, you know, 0.35. But 83% of the kids were low. By first grades, 0.19, and 53%. By second grade, 0.27, 25%. By third grade, it's negligible, and only 16%. So I'm not saying kids who are, I'm saying kids who are struggling readers by second or third grade, that's rarely is their deficit phonemic awareness. Now, these five kids here, give a phone, I'm not telling you not to give them a phonemic awareness intervention. No, absolutely, that's what they need. Just saying that there's 27 kids whom the intervention probably won't help. That's all I'm saying. Um, I, I'm sorry I'm not getting caught up on the comments. Um, uh, That's okay. Yeah. And you're talking uh, about, yeah, the phonemic awareness um, stuff. Yeah, it's reminding me, and I think we're getting some comments now similar to um, 
to what was going on when you were talking about it in um, yep. in on Facebook. Um, and some people too are wondering about um, uh, long term effects, like repeated reading. Um, do when we're yeah. talking effect sizes, that's for within the study. Do we need to be concerned for you know? Do these so effects every, wash out over time? Is there time. Over time. Um, uh, now? Sugate has a wonderful meta analysis, 2016, where they found effects um, lo longitudinally. It's a wonderful study. S U G G A T E, 2016 at all. It's Sugate at all. And they see effects of, of a fluidic rich intervention over time, of a decoding intervention over time, and of a fluency intervention over time, comprehension as well. The effects go way down. All of them go way down over time. But they still can see um, meaningful effects longitudinally. But all of them go down. And I would argue, if, if people are making that criticism, I applaud you, because that's an area of research that needs to be done more. We don't look at the maintenance and generalization of the interventions often enough. So that's, that's, a, that's a legitimate concern. Um, Somebody says, our schools are not teaching phonemic awareness. Hard for kids to go beyond secondary to have it. They haven't been taught. Couldn't agree more. Basic instruction in phonemic awareness is critical in kindergarten through first grade. Uh, and that's when people talk about Hegarty. Hegarty is a terrible intervention, in my opinion, because it tries to teach too much and, and doesn't really focus enough. It tries to cover too much. Uh, but it's a wonderful supplemental tool for kindergarten and first grade if you're not teaching phonemic awareness. It's, it's, it's great. Um, although, although, Although I say that in, in the conversation of science of reading, there are no studies on it, none that I could find, no published ones. And I just recently wrote. Um, I use Google Scholar a lot, by the way. I don't think I mentioned that. Um, I couldn't find any on it. But I would argue it still seems to be a pretty good approach for supplemental instruction for uh, K2. So yeah, if you're not teaching phonemic awareness, you need to be teaching phonemic awareness. That's a problem. But if you are, and kids are struggling with reading by second grade, well, by third grade, for sure. Sometimes a little more frequently in second grade, but by third grade, for sure, the number of kids for whom that's the right intervention is going to go way down. And I don't have data beyond third grade. I'm sorry, I wish I did. Other areas of question, we're moving ahead here for time. Um, vocabulary, what, what, what do we do with vocabulary? Man, some really great stuff has shown that's really important, um, but we're not really sure what that means for instruction. And, and the meta-analysis by the National Reading Panel, they really don't have five areas, they actually have four. They, they did vocabulary and comprehension together because it's tough to tease those two things apart. So the role of vocabulary, I think, is instructionally is a one, still an area for additional research. Emerging bilingual students, we're doing meta-analysis on that right now, and we're troubled by the few uh, studies. Uh, we need more research around that group, and also kids in poverty, I would argue, those are areas. But more important, not more important, but, but from a science of reading perspective, systematically, I think this is critical. Ellis and Bond talk about three levels of research. Level one, is it consistent with theory? Okay, practitioners, don't, don't roll your eyes at me. Uh, not me, but don't, don't, uh, theory, I get it, that's an ugly word, but no, it's not. Ma the main reason, there's two main reasons, I would argue, good, solid interventions with a good research base don't maintain over time. Number one, they're too hard to do and no one does it right. Number two, they stray from the theory from which they were developed. When that happens, it doesn't work anymore. So yes, consistency with theory does matter. Don't worry about that for now. Level two, does it work? That's the tightly controlled study. And, but then that's only half the issue, third, a third of the issue. The, third, the final third is, does it work in the real world? When we take it away from the researchers, does it still work? So we need a lot more translational research, which is Shanahan, again, that special issue on reading research quarterly on, on science of reading. It's a wonderful issue. She talks about that, the need for more translational research. And his argument is we know more about teaching, about reading, and less about how to teach reading. And I don't know if I completely buy that, but... Um, I think his point is well taken, though, that that's really what we need additional research on is, does this actually work out in the real world? So I'm, I'm trying to answer questions as we go. I know, I know it's 8 o'clock. Um, let's see, uh, just a couple more comments. Graduate teaching programs teach about phonemic awareness, 25%. Yeah, that, yeah that's, Andrew, your, your point's well taken that, that teachers are not taught the science of reading. And when 80%, and I'm sorry if that number's off because that's from memory, of surveyed teacher, surveyed teacher educators define phonemic awareness as sound symbol relationship. That's a problem. I think that's a real problem. So yeah, I agree. And I'm, I work in the College of Education. I'm proud to, and, and, and we have a strong one. Um, but I think across the country, you know, that's, I'm not gonna argue with you. I think your, your point is well taken. 
Lots of lots of good questions. I, I, I related to the comment on the FNP before. I'm in an FNP district. I think a lot of us are. And it's funny because uh, I would complain to Eric and Rebecca. Uh, we have like a voice chat going. And I'd be like, oh, the FNP, the FNP. And at first they thought I was saying like, the effing P, like they thought I was mad. It's like they're like, "What is this P?" And then Rachel keeps talking about it, complaining about it. Like, that's, my, that's my students and I call it the effing P. Yeah, that's, that's, <laughs> that. that's, our, that's our name for it. That's funny. But I'll, I'll conclude with Feynman's quote: "If it disagrees with the research, it's wrong." Mm -hmm. Good stuff for sure. Um, I've got all sorts of questions. I want to be yeah. mindful of your time, uh, Dr. Burns, too. Um, so are you okay to hang yeah. on and yes. talk a little bit more? Okay. So, as long uh, as I get to see the second half. <laughs> sounds good. Um, and so, yeah, if anybody um, in the chat wants to post questions, we'll definitely um, take take questions and, and talk. But um, I wanted to, you know, thinking back to kind of the Facebook groups and things and what you're saying about phonemic awareness, um, you know, somebody will post, oh, the student is struggling with fluency or this or that. And then all these comments come in, do phonemic awareness, do phonemic awareness, do phonemic, and, but we don't know anything about what those skills are, but that seems to be like the blanket, like just do it, even though the kid might be in high school, you know, that we're jumping to that conclusion sometimes without gathering the data to see if that is the yeah. deficit area. Yeah, that was part of the reason why I started posting is I saw um, someone, I forget, it doesn't matter, I saw a posting that said something to the effect of, hey, what's a good tier two intervention for sixth grade? And, and the grade was sixth grade. And several people said Hegarty. I said, Hegarty, that's a terrible tier two intervention for sixth grade. So that's why I started objecting. Now, there might be sixth graders who need the phonemic awareness. I wouldn't use Hegarty, but there might be sixth graders who need phonemic awareness. Yes, then they should get that. But that's going to be rare, but they should get that. But we have to base it on data. Mm -hmm. Wait, hold on. I got to read this. Susan, uh, Sue, um, I don't want to say your last name, sorry. Uh, passed a dyslexia law that will go into effect next year. The best part is our forced forced to ditch LLI and FMP. Wow, that's that's really good news. No, uh, that's, that's, I'm happy to see that. Good. And I like that. I I, th I feel like the science of reading then it's billed as this like large body of evidence that everybody like is on board with and research has shown and like there's all this yet you know we're not necessarily seeing it in action. Um, so I think that so much of so many of our researchers and all our data supports it, this and it's seeing these little kind of disparities and kind of little you know as advanced phonemic awareness, advanced phonemic, like these little tiny things within the movement. Um, I don't think it just tracks from the fact that um, there is this overwhelming body. There might be kind of little disagreements within the science of reading that isn't like settled science, it seems. Is that accurate? Oh, well said, Rachel, well said. Yeah, science is not, science is, a, is an ongoing evolution. Um, and, and it has to keep building on what, on the previous work, et cetera. So there's always going to be nuanced points of I wouldn't call them disagreement. Nuance points to points of continued research and need for continued research. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, with, with Sue's question on uh, screeners and dyslexia laws and dyslexia handbooks, I know that Maryland um, recently put um, a law that we have to screen all kinder and first grade students. And so districts are figuring out what screener they're going to use, what's the criteria yeah. going to be, what are you going to do after? Do you have any thoughts on, on screeners? Yes. Yes. So 37 states, although that might be updated, have a uh, dyslexia law. Yeah, and it might be, I haven't looked at that in a while, so that number might go up, might have gone up. Um, the study we just finished, and again, it's under review, so it, it's not published yet. Um, we found that the, many of the, of the screeners that people use for dyslexia, like um, the Shaywitz scale, its diagnostic accuracy was less than 50%. And they'll also use RAN. A lot of states are, rep are proposing rapid automatized naming. The, the, the best measure to predict reading under the area of RAN is letter naming and letter sound. Colors, shapes, and those other ones don't predict as well as reading. The problem is in order to be, for it to be truly rapid automatized naming, the kids have to know it. So you, you have to know all the letters for it to be rapid automatized naming. Um, that's why you use shapes and colors because they, have, they know those. Um, but if they don't, then those aren't good measures either. But they don't predict reading quite as well as, as letter naming, letter sound. So, so states if, and districts, I'm sorry, if you're screening reading, you're a good screening uh, reading screener like Ames Web, FastBridge, Dibbles, although Dibbles, I would, argue, I would like the Ames Web and FastBridge over, over Dibbles. But Dibbles is fine. Um, Star, Map, all of those, that's a good way to start a, re a screener for dyslexia that works better than Shaywitz, better than uh, RAN. 
And then you're doing letter naming fluency, you're doing nonsense word fluency as a measure of decoding, you're doing, you know, you're doing the basic reading screeners we do already, you are screening for decoding. If you're not doing already, I'm sorry, decoding dyslexia, sorry, got my, got my big D words mixed up. Um, if you're not doing those, that's a problem. But if you're already screening with STAR and then you follow up with those assessments or you're also doing you know, oral reading fluency, nonsense word fluency, et cetera, you're already meeting you're already screening for dyslexia. I can't say you're meeting the law. You are in Missouri. You are in Missouri. But in other states, I can't say without reading your law. Um, but you are screening for dyslexia with a tool that is at least as good as, as not better than Shaywitz, than, than um, RAND, than other things we use in the name of, of dyslexia screening. So if you're screening for reading, remember dyslexia basically means a reading deficit with a core issue in, in, in the phonological aspects of, of reading, coding and, and phonemic awareness. So if you're measuring those things, you're screening for dyslexia. Any thoughts on, uh, I see states with, I was in Texas, they had a dyslexia handbook that outlined how to evaluate for dyslexia. And I, I think there might be some movement to do that in Maryland. Um, I know that dyslexia is difficult to agree on a definition and a cutoff point. Yeah, so, no, yes and no, I have lots of thoughts, but, but um, none I really want to get into too much, not many I want to get into too much detail here. Let me say a couple things. Uh, we talked a lot about the CTOP. I encourage you as school psychologists to go look at the CTOP manual. It's a good test to use it all the time. It's reliability for the phonemic awareness sub uh, uh, scales uh, are, are quite low, like eh, 0.74. I shouldn't say quite low. Perfectly fine for my reasons, you know, my research work. But as a screener, it's, it can be questionable and certainly as a diagnostic tool. So if you're using a measure like you know, star I mentioned a good reliable reading measure, and you want to follow it up with CTOP, that's that's arguably better. Um, it, uh, some of the other measures I've already mentioned a couple of times, I don't think really add much. Um, I just want to talk about CTOP for a second. I don't think it's a great screener. I think it's a good tool. I use it all the time, so make sure you get it, use it the right way. Um, in terms of, the, of an actual manual, I don't know. It depends on what, on what the actual manual says. My guess is that oftentimes those manuals go in directions that aren't needed. Uh, remember, dyslexia is a reading deficit. If you're screening reading and you follow it up with a measure of decoding, you are assessing dyslexia. And I think really going beyond that is not really helpful and um, costs a lot of time and money. So who just posted that? Andrew, I think that was you. I'm sorry if it wasn't you about SLPs. Most, much of what we know about reading in the early years of reading research is from speech and language. Absolutely. So speech and language pathologists, they know their stuff when it comes to phonemic awareness. They know their stuff when it comes to language comprehension. Yeah, absolutely. collaborate with your SLP as often as you can. All right, I'm looking for questions. I have all mine, but I don't want to hog. So <laughs> I want to give other people a chance to <laughs> jump in if they have something. Let's see. Um, so, okay. Uh, talk to me, uh, advanced phonemic awareness. I've seen differing, differing opinions on how, what level does your phonemic awareness skill need to be to be proficient enough to be able to accurately engage in the reading process and whatnot. Do you need to be doing, you know, manipulation and, and things of that, or is just segmenting enough? Like where, how advanced well, do we need to get? No, I would argue you need to be all the way to manipulate. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, so if you think about the, the ladder of phonological awareness, you know, that starts with word, sentences are made of words and, and words, you know, you have compound words and, and all the way down to the, the phoneme level, um, you have to have that whole continuum. And fortunately for the vast majority of kids, that continuum is pretty sequential. Um, so no, I would argue if a kid can't manipulate, they don't have phonemic awareness. Uh, if they can't blend and segment, sure, of course. But I think all the way through the completed ladder uh, has to be in place to, to say, yep, this kid's got effective phonemic awareness. My colleagues and I, when we did press the Path to Reading Excellence in School Sites, uh, we, it's a reading intervention program. Uh, we weren't thrilled with the, some of the phonemic awareness uh, measures available, so we created one, and it assesses those four areas, right? In, in four areas, <laughs> I didn't mean to go five, but four areas, um, that uh, included manipulation, blending, segmenting, uh, initial sound, et cetera. So if you and if you failed any one of those areas, you didn't demonstrate phonemic awareness. So no, I think you have to go all the way through to manipulation. 
and then it kind of runs into um, advanced phonics. So um, I, you know, some programs just are kind of basic, you know, letter sound correspondence. Some go into like, you know, syllable types and more advanced phonics patterns and things of that nature. Um, is there, at, at what point do you know enough phonics rules, I guess is my question. Oh, is that's a really good question. That's a harder to answer because it's such a developmental sequence. Mm -hmm. um, if a kid can't manipulate in kindergarten or can't manipulate in fifth grade for phonemes, that's a problem. But if a kid, you know, can, can decode CVC words in, in first grade, that's great. But that's all you can do in fifth grade, that's a problem. So it's a little more difficult to answer for, for decoding. I would argue that um, the, the sequence of decoding skills for that grade level need to be mastered to be proficient. We have a question about RAN. Um, yeah, RAN is, RAN is helpful for preschool. Um, RAN, the typical RAN of pictures and shapes, et cetera, are, is really helpful for preschool because, again, if they don't know the, the stimulus, it can't be RAN used to measure RAN. Uh, so, so that makes sense for preschool, absolutely. But once they're in school aged and they, they start to learn the letter names, uh, letter naming fluency, the letter, the letter, the, the, um, what's the term they use? The, the, reading-based stimuli are much better predictors of reading than, than the other ones. I'm not, I can't even the term, it's such a, such a basic term, it's, it's frustrating me. Um, anyway, but if it's these sort of reading-based skills, they're much better predictors, but you can't use them for WAN in preschool usually. So, so, um, so it, it's, it, yes, RAN can have a place in identifying dyslexia, absolutely. All I'm saying is, if you're already doing letter naming fluency, you're probably, for most of the kids, doing RAN. Now, if they bomb it and get a zero, I would probably do a different type of RAN for that kid, just to be safe. And I'm assuming that um, with all these skills, when we're talking about advanced phonemic skills and advanced phonic skills, um, we, we, we're teaching things to mastery and proficiency, right? Because um, we, we've talked before about the kid that can do the phonemic awareness, skill, like the CTOP isn't timed or some of these measures aren't timed, but the ones that take a while to do it, that that factors in, I'm assuming that the RAN would kind of capture some of those. Type of. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Yes. Yeah. The, the fluency based skills. Yeah, absolutely. I did a meta analysis in 2004. We wanted to see how much do kids need to know to really consider it to be actually not even proficient, just instructional and at, for accuracy. And it was 90%. So until they reach 90%, um, I, it's not, it's not proficient. So I think, I think, you know, and, and above 90%, then it starts to get to be measurement error type things, you know, between 95 and hundred percent could be measurement error, but certainly, you know, less than 90% is not learned. Matt, I love that you talked about um, really measuring these as skills. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think a lot of times with school, as, as school psychologists, when we get a reading referral, you know, it, it uh, eligibility, of course, is is typically the first uh, question that you know gets answered, and then eligibility within state parameters and our district's interpretation. And so, a lot of times, people, you know, we're we're looking at test scores rather than actually looking at the measured skill and the practice uh, of the skill. And so, um, you know, if we compare maybe just mm -hmm. a test like the WJ phonemic awareness versus CTOP, you have all of those skills lumped together with one score on the WJ, whereas on, on the CTOP, you're actually able to look at elision, mm -hmm. blending, uh, manipulation. And I think that's really important um, for us when we're assessing these kinds of things to look at the the um, level of skill, not just a, a standard score for a, a, mm -hmm. yeah, a category more, called PA or something. More. So we, we like to work backwards to find the most fundamental skill, and then we have to break that skill apart. Now, the Woodcock Johnson um, will do that first step, no problem. It does that. So it might demonstrate an average score in the phonemic awareness test, uh, test but you know, a, a low average or a deficit in nonsense work. Um, what does Woodcock Johnson call it? Their, um, the word attack and, and word attack. Um, and so that suggests decoding. So yeah, but then you're not done with that. So now I recommend, and this is what most school psychs would probably push back on as practitioners, that you take another quick screener and assess that to find out what's the specific skill within that area they're struggling with. There are lots of published decoding uh, inventories. They take about five minutes to do. Uh, I've, I've mentioned my phonemic awareness measure that we developed, um, the past, which is free and used a lot online. That's another one that can be free. The CTOP, of course, can do this as well. There's lots of ways, things you can do. I would argue that 
once you get eligibility, look at the data to see which what's the core deficit area, the lowest area in which the kids struggle, the most fundamental area in which kids struggle, and then dive a little bit more deeply. It'll take five minutes. And I think teachers will really find those data valuable. What my special ed teacher used to tell me when I was a practitioner, that um, they can sit down and write an IEP off one of my reports. That should be the goal. They should be able to write an IEP off one of your reports. I love that. I love when I'm able to direct teachers to like specific goals, like you need to work on this thing right here. Like, <laughs> I think mm -hmm. that's, that's not difficult to do. Yeah, it does take a few more minutes. You can analyze the data you already have. And I, I, yes, I agree. It'll probably take you five, 10 more minutes and then another you know, five, 10 more minutes to write it up and stuff. So it does take more time. I absolutely agree. So thoughts of measures of or okay yeah let me ask the answer that yeah they're fine um, I, I I would it depends on the measure um, uh, I I would like to see if they if they are um, um, if they assess with actual stimuli that are reading based et cetera because I've seen some crazy ones then yeah I think it's a fine measure to use and I can give you some useful information sure. Previously, you talked to us about, um, you know, your meta-analysis meta looking at um, cognitive and neuropsychological mm -hmm. data and how that is not helpful for instructional purposes and um, designing interventions. I see frequently, though, um, uh, on Facebook often where people say, you know, this kid has low processing speed. They're never going to make a fluency goal. So let's not work on fluency or let's not write a goal for fluency. It's not fair to the student. They're not going to be flu fluent because they have low processing speed. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I think that's, a, 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 I don't want to be critical, um, but I would question the research around that particular statement. Um, uh, I, is, the processing speed is one of the measures that I think doesn't translate it translates the least to instruction. And it makes the most intuitive sense. Um, I actually think there's been you know, lots of instances where kids who score low on that uh, can still do well with, with, now what it tells you, in my opinion, is that's an area of, re of remediation. So if, if, you're, if a kid does score low on processing speed, then maybe you want to think about doing something to make sure you're, you're helping the kid be more fluent in the skill, although the effects of doing so are pretty small. So I'm as so as a school psych, I'm probably not going to write in my IEP. You know, he had low processing skills, so he should get repeated reading. But if the kid scores low in fluency, um, then you know, then that might be a reason to argue for repeated reading or something like that. Um, so no, I don't think I don't think I'm going to look at I'm, gonna, I'm not going to look at any. T I, I'm going to start getting preachy though, so I got to stop because I tell you about the about my kid. I named I named him Lonnie, who was cognitively impaired in kindergarten and. Uh, the school said we couldn't work with him anymore, and, and we said we'd still want to. The mom said we wanted to, and by second grade, he was a grade level reader. Like you just, you just, you don't, you, you, you can't put too much stock in a score as a prediction. In fact, the meta analysis we did, me and Sarah Schollen, oh gosh, what year was that? I don't remember. Um, probably 2012. I made that number up. Um, we saw that studies, uh, pre-intervention data, including IQ and other types of measures like that predict post-intervention reading quite well, but they do a very poor job of predicting both. So you just can't tell ahead of time who will respond to the intervention. <laughs> I'm laughing at one of the comments, Breach. <laughs> um, we did, we, I, I don't remember whether we talked about um, Mizzou's website, but you, you all have a lot of good intervention information. Your um, face, um, YouTube page as well, um, I don't yeah, know if you want to direct uh, I will to, to two of them. So what Eric's talking about is the, the um, evidence-based intervention network, EBI network. I didn't talk about it here because it doesn't talk about research. All it does is show this is the intervention. Here's how to do it. And there's lots of scripts and lots. It's all free. You want a reading, math, behavior intervention, writing intervention. You go, you click on reading, click on math, whatever, click on whatever area, and it gives you some intervention suggestions. Um, the, my YouTube page, just search Matthew Burns, it comes up, it's a YouTube page. I've got a bunch of videos, like, I don't know how many I have, I should look. Um, but a large number of videos, roughly, which were just model some interventions. And so if you want to have fun, go look at my um, videos on phonemic awareness with AJ. Oh my God, he's hysterical. He's a little kindergartner. I love those, I love those, I love him. <laughs> You don't have to watch, read. you don't have to care about reading to, to think that's funny. He's hysterical. So um, yeah, my YouTube page, I've got some videos, how to do interventions and the ones I've been doing lately, how to do interventions remotely, how to do it through Zoom, et cetera. And so um, that's what that one is, how to do phonemic awareness remotely. He's just hysterical. So check it out. 
Yes, I shared those out with some of my special educators that I work with. And one of the comments that came back, they're just like, that kid is awesome. And I, <laughs> <laughs> I was like, well, also pay attention to the intervention. But yes. yeah, right. He actually trended. There was a, he, because at one point he like gets bored and stands up. And there, someone put on Twitter, uh, today during one of our meetings, I channeled my inner AJ. Hashtag inner AJ trended for a little while, for like a couple hours. It was pretty cool. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Um, I think it's super cool that we we seem to have some decoding dyslexia people watching. Tonight. I just saw that. I'm excited about that. I hope I didn't just uh, hope I didn't discourage you or offend you with my conversations around Orton Gillingham. But I'm glad you're here because I, I really support the work that decoding dyslexia has done. Yeah, they're they're awesome, and they they amaze me too. That I mean, the knowledge base that many mm -hmm. of these parents have that this is not mm -hmm. what they were looking for, like like us. But um, they have they have mm -hmm. so much knowledge. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Yeah. Um, um, okay, well, we're looking for some more comments, but also uh, stealth dyslexia, that's something that I seem to see popping up. Have you have you heard that term? I yeah, um, okay. yes. No, well, well uh, you, tell, tell me how you're using it, though. What do you mean? So, Let, what, go ahead. so I often see on, on, and I've searched around for it a little bit and haven't found any concrete, but again, dyslexia is, is such that, um, you know, it's difficult to define that, but um, sometimes people will post, oh, this, this child is struggling with, with uh, spelling, but you know, they're reading on grade level and uh, phonemic awareness checks out and phonics checks out and all these things are good. And then all these comments come up, they're like, it must be stealth dyslexia. And I'm like, how? <laughs> okay, good. Okay. So, so, um, spelling is a funny one. Yeah, that's, spelling is a funny one. I was about to comment on, on different types of dyslexia because there's really no research to support different types of, of dyslexia. Um. But but that that one um, there spelling is a funny one because there are it's a it's a high, frequently high false positive. There are lots of kids who are good readers for whom spelling is an issue, and for mo vast majority of the time it doesn't matter. Um, it's, well, let me, let, me more, let me say that more clearly. In fourth, fifth, fifth, sixth, seventh grade, if they're still a good reader but low decoding, uh, low uh, spelling doesn't matter. If they're in second grade, then it does. Because then that might suggest some sort of decoding deficit that won't really show up until third, fourth, fifth grade. So, so K2, although K2, but first through third grade, spelling being low, everything else being fine is a red flag. Seventh grade, it's not. Okay. So uh, I shouldn't say it's not. It probably isn't. Um, so if a kid's low on spelling or one aspect of reading and not the others in early elementary, that's an issue. That's an argument. That's a concern. But if I'm a, if I got a seventh grader who comprehends fine, reads fluently, but spelling is bad, I'm probably not going to be too worried about that. So so stealth dyslexia is that a, is that a thing or not? I don't know. Uh, is is low spelling skills a concern? If that's the only area of deficit, K two, yeah, I think it is. I'm seeing a comment here. Um... What about individuals who learn to read later than what is considered typical? Often I find after the fact that a family member also learned to read later. Um, now, uh, you know, we're asking this on developmental history. Yeah. So a comment on that. Oh, man. Uh, the, I forget the number, we reviewed 120, I think it was, school psych reports, all uh, LD referrals. Not all reading, but all LD. The single best predictor of reading problems in, of any kid's record, is family history of reading problems. And in the background interviews for all the uh, LD evals, not a single one of them reported family history or not. Uh, I find that alarming. If you're doing a family, somebody, I, I'm again, kind of skimming the comments. Um, somebody, oh, the person who asked that question, you asked that on developmental history. Um, can I see who said that? Uh, Serena, I hope, hope I'm saying that right. Awesome, yes, do that. Everyone should do that, yes. Um, but, Kids who learn to read later, um, that's not, that's not, that's not um, a sign of abnormality. But I'm not going to use it as a reason to not intervene. So if I have a second grader who's still kind of struggling, he might be fine. He might be fine in a couple of years. But his parents kind of struggled, but they're now professionals and did fine. I'm not going to use it as a reason to not intervene. Okay, so that's all I'll say about that. I think you have to. Um, I think there's, it's a, I think it's, it happens. It's not very common. I think it's, you should be asking developmental history about reading problems, but just because there's a family history of that doesn't mean I'm going to not intervene now. Uh, 
oh my gosh, uh, when kids reach high school and can't decode, nobody recognized it. This should not, that shouldn't happen. Like that just should not happen. That's inexcusable for a child to be that, to get to that. If, as long as, as long as they have decoding deficits the whole way, that should just shouldn't. I mean, that's, that's inexcusable. It, ha- it does happen. I don't know who SGA is. It does happen, I'm sure, but it shouldn't. There's no reason for that to happen today. We know so much about reading. We screen so much. There's no reason for that to happen. What about this observation from Sue? She works at two gifted ac- ac- academies. They don't teach reading. Kids come in mm-hmm. reading. So there are many poor yeah, spellers. Yeah, I don't know anything about, about gifted kids. I, 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 what gifted kids do? Good readers make no sense to me whatsoever. Mm-hmm. Um, what grade is that? Fifth grade? I'm sorry. Was it fifth grade? Fifth and six. Well, I don't know because I don't think about gifted kids. Um, if it's just low spelling, I'm not terribly alarmed. Probably, um, if their comprehension is really good, et cetera, et cetera. If, by the way, if their if their kid is really high IQ because they're gifted and their math skills are off the charts, and their comprehension is average and their decoding is low, well, that's that's then that those pieces of information together gives me a red flag. Um, uh, I, I would argue, I'm making this up right now, fifth and sixth grade, gifted kid, moves in, can't decode. I'm going to treat that as a red flag for a gifted kid. But I, I wonder about the, the part of that where she said that they don't teach reading. Oh, oh you know? yes, I didn't catch that. Yes, yes. Oh, then that, that changes everything. Yes. Then yes. That's the, yeah, the people, I think, assume, okay, you're gifted. You can read already, so we don't need to actually teach it. And then maybe that turns out to be uh, a spell. That's the most important part of the whole of the whole question and comment. I, I, I it didn't it didn't hit me. Uh, yes, if that's the case, then that's a serious red flag. So, so I'm, what, again, would you I'm go? Comment, I'm, I'm responding to some of these comments that family history was nixed from Maryland screen because it was a privacy issue. But well, that's um, that's unfortunate. It's really unfortunate. Okay, so Sue so responded, followed up. I guess I wonder if we should teach them how to read. Yes, yes, but teach them how to read before fifth grade. If they come in as a fifth grader who's struggling with spelling, they're gifted, they never were taught reading, I'm probably going to get out rewards. Uh, Anita Archer's direct instruction program for kids above fourth grade, multisyllabic, uh, requires a basic reading level to do it. Um, I forget the grade level, like third grade or something. So probably a fifth grader who struggles with spelling probably can do it. Yes, I'm doing rewards with that kid. And we had a comment about, um, I think, some disappointment about maybe uh, my dismissal of stealth dyslexia. And I want to just clarify that I I wouldn't dismiss a child who's struggling. Um, I think my questions about it are from a diagnostic standpoint um, and maybe questioning more if um, there's instructional things going on and whatnot, but to label a kid and and say, you know, this is a diagnosis of stealth dyslexia, which I don't think that there's necessarily research to support that as a discrete thing. Like like you said, Matt, that there's subtypes of dyslexia. Um, That where my um, frustration comes with that. Uh, I'll, so here, I will differ with decoding dyslexia on one important point. I think I agree with 100% that we don't teach reading a good job in schools. We don't do a good job teaching reading in schools. We don't meet the needs of kids who struggle with reading. We don't. I mean, everything they say, couldn't agree more. We need to be doing decoding. Couldn't agree more. Um, I don't think diagnosing kids with dyslexia is the answer. Um, I love, because first of all, let school's off the hook. Right, it says, oh, it's not your fault. It's the kid's fault. You know, they have dyslexia, and they might, they might. I don't know, but I don't care if they do or don't. We still need to teach them, and so, and so, I think we can certainly um, screen for dyslexia. And I'm not saying don't do that, but, 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 I don't think the solution to the number of kids who have reading problems is to to identify all of them with dyslexia. I think it's to, and they don't say that either, is to. Um, uh, really push the schools to do better jobs of meeting the needs of kids, do better core instruction and better interventions for kids who struggle with decoding. Yeah, so 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 this sort of stealth dyslexia is, for me, contextualized with this larger conversation around dyslexia and its role in, in teaching reading and teaching kids who struggle to read. And I don't think we need more labels. I think we need more instruction. Right, because, you know, sadly, intervention ends sometimes with the IEP, Mm -hmm. you know, and it's not a slam on special ed teachers, but um, the identification doesn't mean the kid is going to get 
um, improved instruction yeah. and improved outcomes. Yeah, we just finished a study, a study in press in learning to, no, Journal of LD, where we had three groups of kids, good readers, kids who are getting targeted tier two interventions, but who are really low in reading, below the 10th percentile. The kids who are LD who are also below the 10th percentile in reading. And the kids that grew the most were the tier two below the 10th percentile because they were getting intervention, I think. Um, we didn't measure this, but I think their, their intervention was targeted to their needs. It was, you know, it was a nice, solid intervention we knew that was being delivered with fidelity. And perhaps that didn't happen, especially if we don't know. But the kids who grew the most were those tier two kids. I totally agree. I see that in my district sometimes where, you know, are we qualifying this kid for special ed? And I know that right now they're in a research base intervention and I know that they're getting the things that they need and you go into special ed and there is no guidelines for the type of program. And I mean, you get to work with a special ed teacher and that's the only difference and right. what, what curriculum they use, if any, <laughs> there's no rules. <laughs> right. Exactly. So I'm, I'm uh, decoding dyslexia, Maryland. Uh, just commented that parents would prefer the schools teach reading rather than address students' needs in special ed. Thank you for saying that. Yeah, uh, good. Then, we, then on that point, we agree 100%. Rachel, you're muted. Whoops. I will say that um, <laughs> Reading League is an agency that pushes for that good core tier one instruction. And uh, in, in, in Maryland, that's kind of getting up and, and going. And I will say that there's a lot of um, good participation from just coding dyslexia on there. And that just like, I, I think that that's awesome. <laughs> you know, because it's one thing to, um, I think a lot of these parents get into this whole kind of Thing with dyslexia because they're their kids and you have to advocate for your own kid and then parents that go beyond advocating for their own kid and say hey what about all these other kids that are in the, on the FMP train like that to me is like really commendable to fight for yeah. everyone absolutely Okay, I think, sorry, I, I know we're like half an hour over and it, it's totally my fault and I apologize, but when I have you here, I'm like wanna drill you on all this stuff. <laughs> You're not the only one. The comments are, are on Facebook and Twitter and in the YouTube chat. So we've, we've been having such a great, rich yeah. um, conversation. We really appreciate you, Dr. Burns. Oh, I appreciate this, thank you. Okay, if we don't have any other kind of last minute um, type of questions, I think this is really, really helpful to me, really good conversation. And um, I know that it's, you talked a lot about research and I think a big problem is that to get our hands on it, well, to also understand it once we do get our hands on it. But I think that the Google Scholar thing is um, really helpful, but we see, uh, blogs, like you said, blogs and things passed around and books that you can buy on Amazon, which are great and, and have, you know, a lot of use. But it's another thing to be able to talk to somebody who truly understands kind of the research and be able to track that down and kind of translate that for us is very helpful to me. Good. And by the way, honestly, I can be your search engine. You email me and say, hey, we're doing research on this. I, I enjoy taking five minutes, finding an article and sending it to people. Uh, I do that on Facebook. I, uh, somebody will post a question, I'll just simply search it. If there's an article, I post it. And if I can, I say I can find an article. So, um, but Google Scholar, the website's like intensive intervention, buy the Hattie book. Those are great, great resources as well. Sounds good. All right. I think we're going to wrap up. Um, I normally would say what what we have going on next. Rebecca or Eric, do you remember who our next guest is? <laughs> I have it, pandemic uh, brain. I can't remember anything except for what I'm doing like in the next hour. <laughs> but we will, we will post and share for yes, sure. And let's start um, the events page. It's Dr. Jeremy Sharp. So the testing psychologist, we've been a guest on his podcast. And so he is going to be a guest on ours on 1220. Yes, talking about private practice and how to get yourself into private practice, deal with insurance and uh, setting up and all that good stuff. So awesome. Thank you so much. Good night, everybody. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.